morning children i am professor sumita parmar i am the principal investigator for this paper or the subject being women studies and today i am going to be talking about a very important aspect of women studies which is uh, research methodology now this paper is divided into two parts paper 12 Paper twelve, part one is on science and technology, and part two is on feminist um, research methodology. So today I will be talking about feminist research methodology, module fifteen. This paper has been written by Dr. Narsimha Kedari from the uh, Languages Institute, English and Foreign La Language Institute, Lucknow. Let's first look at some definitions of what feminist scholarship is. Bernice Lott says that feminist scholarship distinguishes itself from others in its choice of problems and ultimate objectives. Marjorie De Walt, who is a sociologist, says the dilemma. for the feminist scholar always is to find ways of working within some disciplinary tradition while aiming at the intellectual revolution that will transform that tradition carolyn burke claims that the strength of the women's movement is its ability to acknowledge serious disagreements on topics including feminist methods from the start feminists have recognized the need to reform research practices a case in point is of the 19th century british sociologist harriet martineau who believed that observers typically misunderstood the societies they studied the pro the problem as she saw it was that observers compared other societies with their own that point was echoed in the writing of feminist critics of the late 1970s who pointed out that male researchers misunderstood women because they compared women to men now let's look at what feminist research is and here are some definitions Naomi Black says that feminist research insists on the value of subjectivity and personal experience. While Liz Stanley says feminist research is absolutely and centrally a research by women because I see a direct relationship between feminist consciousness and feminism. Rosalind Bullock, a, sex, a sociologist concerned with the feminist theory and research methodology, says the question of difference is one with the question of identity. It is becoming the criteria, the, the critical question for financial, for feminist uh, theorization in all the disciplines. as feminists begin to question and challenge the implicit male pers pers perspective of the dominant paradigms methodological structures and theoretical assumptions of the various disciplines so the question of identity translates into what are feminist research methods and questions of difference into what is the difference between feminist research methods and other research methods though the above definitions indicate the variety in feminist research they also point at what feminist research is and illustrate what it includes to collect to categorize and examine the multitude of feminist research voices feminist research practices have gained plurality instead of being a woman's way of knowing 
or a feminist way of doing research, there are now women's ways of knowing. Now, feminist research methodology is centered on four questions. One, is there a feminist research method? Two, if so, what does it actually consist of? Three, should there be separate feminist research methods? And four, what is the relation between feminist research methods and other methods? Just as there was a diverse set of views about educating women during the first wave of women's movement, there are diverse views today about the knowledge feminists wish to produce. These voices are engaged in discussions about feminist methodology. Does it exist? What is it? Are there different types? Is there a female or feminist cognitive style that could inform an alternative method? Does academia depoliticize feminism? Is feminist methodology more methodology and less feminism? To understand these questions and get their answers, we need to look into history. During the first wave of the women's movement, women struggled for the right to be educated. In the second wave, women strove for additional goals related to education, the right to criticize the accepted body of knowledge, the right to create knowledge, and the right to be educators and educational administrators. At first, the very act of discovering sexism in scholarship was revolutionary. That discovery clarified the mission of feminist scholarship and made it possible to demonstrate to suspicious non-feminists that there was indeed a problem that needed to be addressed. Elizabeth Minnick in her discussion says, to a stunning extent, the interests of one half of the human race have not been thought about through history. Men have not thought about them, and women have been kept ignorant. If we adopt uncritically the framework, the tools, the scholarship created overwhelmingly by and for men, we have already excluded ourselves. We are being forced to try to discover new intellectual constructs because many of those we have simply don't fit our experience and were never intended to. During the first wave of the feminist movement, feminist critics of the dominant culture fused their criticism and downplayed their differences. During the early 1970s, in the second feminist wave, when new rights were beginning to be asserted, Jesse Bernard in My Four Revolutions wrote that practically all sociology to date has been a sociology of the male world. Later in 1978, when Mary Daly argued that the very concern with methodology was a reflection of patriarchy. The definition of feminist research methodology became more complicated. A further dimension was introduced when Jean Gross and Bell Hooks claimed in 1984 that academic feminism was part of white culture. And feminist research became defined for some as part of the problem rather than the solution. Bell Hooks's harsh critique of white women's research efforts proclaimed that even though they may be sincerely concerned about racism, their methodology suggests they are not yet free of the type of paternalism endemic to white supremacist ideology.
early feminist scholars critiqued existing research for leaving women and their concerns out of the picture. They argued that bringing women's experience into view would produce fresh insights and the work that has been done since has certainly confirmed that view. A legitimate criticism of many of the classic urban ethnographies in the qualitative tradition is that women are missing from them. For example, W. F. White's Street Corner Society and Laibo's Tally's Corner attempted to analyze the social organization of poor urban communities by a nearly exclusive focus on male members of street corner groups. As Richardson noted in 1992, feminist scholarship showed that a look at urban life from the vantage point of women yielded a very different picture. Most feminist research builds on the ideas of social oppression and inequality. And feminist researchers have joined with those concerned with other dimensions of inequality. From this perspective, qualitative research must be conducted with an understanding of how the broader social order oppresses different categories of people by race, by gender, or class. These researchers refer to the simultaneous interwoven effects of these oppressions as intersectionality. More generally, feminist research takes as subject matter for study issues of potential importance to women and uses women's standpoint as a point of departure for research. A solid contribution of feminist research since the 1990s has been the publication of studies rooted in the qualitative tradition but undertaken with attention to women or from a woman's standpoint. For example, Cantor's book, Men and Women of the Corporation, written in 1993, analyzed work life in a large organization from a vantage point that included the predominantly female clerical staff and executives' wives, as well as the few women working as tokens in male-dominated occupational categories. In her book, Feeding the Family, DeVault examined the gendered nature of the invisible work that goes into the preparation of food. DeVault provided insights into not only women's household work, but the construct of family itself. She argued that the feeding work traditionally undertaken by women is both produced by and produces family as we have known it. The work itself feeds not only household members, but also the family as an ideological construct. Thus, taken for granted largely unarticulated understandings of family stand in the way of equity. DeVault also pointed out that interviewing women may require special attention to the nuances of language and experiences that are not easily captured by conventional linguistic forms. Other researchers such as Reisman have cautioned that gender is not enough and urged feminist researchers to be aware of similar issues related to race, ethnicity, and social class in keeping with their commitment to intersectional analysis. As demonstrated by feminist researchers, gender is not only a fruitful area for study, theorizing, and writing, but a factor that warrants 
methodological attention as well. Women may face special problems conducting research in male dominated settings. The British sociologist Anne Oakley argued that interviewing women in conventional ways could be a contradiction in terms. As a feminist researcher, she wanted to do research to help participants, but she had been taught to respond in a non-committal way if an interviewee asked her a question, saying, for example, I haven't really thought about that. However, she found that many of the women participants saw her as a knowledgeable friend and asked her for information about childbirth and motherhood. She didn't feel it was right to ignore and deflect those requests. Now, institutional ethnography. Institutional ethnography was developed by Canadian sociologist Dorothy E. Smith as a feminist sociology and has since then become widely known and used as a sociology for people. Institutional ethnographers think of the approach as more than just a method. It is a mode of inquiry that combines distinctive ways of conducting research with its own theoretical grounding, or more precisely, its ontological principles. Now, ontolog ontology refers to the research researcher's sense of what is there in the world we investigate, and institutional ethnographers are committed to the idea that social organization is always built from people's activities. During the 1980s, Smith built on the feminist critique of male-centered scholarship and developed a mode of investigation that begins with the experiences and activities of some anchor group, women, people with disabilities, teachers or students, and so on and then goes on to explore the web of social relations that produces those experiences. The central idea is to conduct an investigation for rather than of the group. That is, not just to describe the group's perspectives, but instead to develop knowledge that will be useful for that group. A feminist research highlights the importance of analyzing and presenting reality from the vantage point of powerless people in society. This is called the vantage points in feminist research method methodology. It develops theory or tells the research story from the historically neglected perspective of women. Critical ethnography and certain versions of postmodernism do not merely present the points of view of powerless people, the marginalized or oppressed, but challenge traditional authority structures. Feminist researchers have developed an extensive literature on research methods based on goals and commitments such as improving women's status of, or services for women or advancing the cause of gender justice. DeWalt wrote about the usefulness of feminist methodological principles in various kinds of oppositional research aimed at social change. Native researchers have also written about indigenous methodologies that take into account perspectives and community-based values of native peoples. Uh, qualitative reporting of personal experience. In the 1990s, a new genre of qualitative reporting encouraged by feminist and postmodern theories emerged in which qualitative researchers wrote about 
their personal experiences, not merely as researchers, but as central subjects of their studies. The use of personal experience as background information for studies is probably as old as qualitative research itself. What distinguished this new form of ethnographic writing is that the researcher or author occupies center stage in the study being reported. Carolyn Ellis led the way in making a case for an emotional sociology based on personal narratives of the author's own experiences. In Final Negotiations, a story of love, loss, and chronic illness, Ellis told the love story of her relationship with Jean Weinstein, who died after a long and difficult battle with emphysema. Ellis's narrative style was direct, honest, and intimate. She described her innermost feelings, as well as the most personal details of her relationship with Weinstein, informed by sociological interests, but without the analysis and theorizing generally found in qualitative studies. Ellis's text drew the reader inside the experience of loving and finally losing a loved one. Feminist researchers such as Kager, reacting to the male biases they perceived in mainstream social sciences before the 1970s, led the way in developing a literature on research reflexivity. Although early qualitative researchers did not always discuss these kinds of dynamics explicitly, in the contemporary context, it is important to acknowledge the researcher's identity and social location and how these have influenced the research. Inspired by postmodernist and feminist approaches, qualitative researchers have been experimenting with new forms of writing ethnography and qualitative research. More recently, as research on gender issues has become increasingly race and class sensitive, feminist researchers have addressed similar issues, considering how the cross-cutting lines of gender and other oppressions work to facilitate or obstruct qualitative research. Feminist critical discourse analysis as political practice. Feminist critical discourse analysis are concerned with critiquing discourses which sustain a patriarchal social order, that is, relations of power that systematically privilege men and disadvantage, exclude and disempower women as a social group. One of the aims is to show that social practices on the whole far from being neutral, are in fact gendered in this way. The gendered nature of social practices can be described on two levels. First, gender functions as an interpretative category that enables participants in a community to make sense of and structure their particular social practices. Second, gender is a social relation that enters into and partially constitutes all other social relations and activities. Conclusion. Feminism is a perspective, not a research method. Feminists use a multiplicity of research methods. Feminist research is transdisciplinary. 
it aims to create social change and strives to represent human diversity. It frequently includes the researcher as a person and attempts to develop special relations with the people studied, that is through interactive research. It attempts to establish a special relation with the reader. Most feminist researchers acknowledge that they are housed in particular academic disciplines and theories and connected to feminist scholarship as well as to the women's movement. The fact that there are multiple definitions of feminism means that there are also multiple feminist perspectives on social research methods. One common factor underlining feminist research is the feeling that women's lives are important. For feminist researchers, females are worth examining as individuals and as people whose experience is interwoven with other women. In other words, feminists are interested in women as individuals and a social category. Thank you.